Thank you, everyone, for joining us. Uh, we've just hit one o'clock and, and there are still some people coming in, but we should get started as time is of the essence. Uh, firstly, I'd like to acknowledge that uh, I'm coming to you today from the lands of the medical people of the Eora Nation, and I pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. My name is Matthew Keeley, and I will be the moderator for today's webinar. Uh, welcome to this, the 19th webinar in our series aimed at developing greater knowledge and understanding of the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child in Australia. Welcome too to our international guests who have registered and our international guests are coming to us from Africa, Asia, Europe, the Middle East, the Pacific and the subcontinent. You're very, very welcome. Um, we hope that this webinar uh, is as useful to you as it is, we hope, to our Australian audience as well. Today's webinar focuses on children's rights to receive an education. And this series has been developed by Youth Law Australia, Diplomacy Training Program, and Australian Lawyers for Human Rights, and is supported by the academics, Doctors Noam Peleg, Faith Gordon, and Georgina Demopoulos. A little bit of housekeeping before we begin in earnest. Uh, firstly, could I ask you all please to uh, mute your sound and image, uh, just in order to uh, help the Zoom and internet function today. Um, please, uh, if you are able, uh, enter your questions in and comments uh, via the chat function at any time during the presentations of our two speakers. Um, questions uh, and answers will follow after both of our presenters have presented. And I'll be beginning with those questions and comments that are already appearing in the chat um, and we'll endeavour to deal with those in chronological order. So it may pay to have your questions or comments and get them in early into the chat. And of course, if you're not able to, for any reason, to enter your questions or comments in the chat uh, after our two presenters have presented, uh, you can put your hand up in the Zoom um, and we will attend to answer those questions as well after those in the chat. Um, also, I'd like to draw your attention to the chat because a lot of the documents that are referred to will be linked there. It's often a really rich resource, almost a library of child rights information and education. So please pay attention to the chat for those links as well. I'd like now to introduce our first speaker. Sophie Wiggins is a systems advocate at Queensland Advocacy for Inclusion or QAI for short. And Sophie's passion for upholding the human rights of people with disability emerged after her experience in individual disability advocacy and also her previous work alongside people with disability and their families as a social worker in the health setting. Uh, without further ado, may I introduce Sophie Wiggins. Thank you, Sophie. Thank you very much, Matthew. Um, yes, and thank you so much for having me today. Um, as you said, my name is Sophie Wiggins and I'm a systems advocate with Queensland Advocacy for Inclusion. Um, I'd like to begin today by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land upon which um, we're all gathering. I'm coming to you from Brisbane, and so I'd like to acknowledge the Yagara and Turrbal peoples as the traditional custodians of the land and extend my respect to their elders past and present. And I'd like to also extend that respect to any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples um, joining us today as well. A little bit of information about QAI to start. Um, I'm hoping that you can all see my screen. Um, so QAI is an independent, not-for-profit um, advocacy organisation. We provide uh, systems and individual advocacy for people with a disability in Queensland, which is the state of Australia. Um, we have a number of individual legal and non-legal advocacy services, um, which you can see on the slide there. Um, but um, primarily our roots are all about uh, systems change. Uh, trying to bring about positive change for people with a disability as a group within society. And we do that by um, campaigning for change to attitudes, laws and policy reform. So how does QAI fit into a discussion about the rights of education, uh, you might be wondering. Um, well, regarding our individual advocacy, um, we've been uh, doing a lot of work in the education space. So we actually have a young people's program um, which receives funding from the Department of Education in Queensland 
uh, which provides individual advocacy support to students with a disability and their families um, who are having difficulties accessing education um, with a Queensland State School or they might be in homeschooling. So our service um, supports uh, families to overcome those issues. And our human rights legal service also provides um, legal advice and representation um, on disability discrimination issues, um, which uh, includes education matters as well. In terms of our systems advocacy, however, um, we've had a, a, a focus on education um, for a long time um, and have done a lot of work in this space. Um, for example, our former director uh, was a witness to the Disability Royal Commission uh, initial public hearing, which was on the topic of education. Um, QAI is also a proud member of the Australian Coalition for Inclusive Education, or ACIE, which is a national group of organisations uh, who work together to try and realise inclusive education across Australia. And I think one of the key developments for ACIE um, that I wanted to mention today is the development of a roadmap, which is a 10 year plan um, setting out key short, medium and long term goals um, that need to be taken and actions that need to be taken in order to um, achieve inclusive education across Australia. QAI has also been fortunate enough to participate in the Conference of States Parties to the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. Uh, this is an annual gathering, an annual conference um, at the United Nations where the disability community comes together to reflect on best practice um, of implementation of the CRPD. Uh, and just um, two years ago, QAI uh, co-hosted a side event to the conference. Uh, we did this with Children and Young People with Disability Australia. And it was on specifically on the right to education under Article 24. Um, it was a wonderful event. We heard from uh, many young people with disability who shared their lived experience of the education system in Australia and the ACIE roadmap um, that I mentioned just before was presented in this event um, as a pathway for change. So I've included a link uh, to the event, which I encourage um, everyone to access if they have a chance. And finally, the other systems activity that we often partake in at QAI um, is around law reform activities. Um, so for example, we've provided submissions to um, the review of the Disability Standards for Education um, and our law reform work can be found on our website. But in terms of the right to education, um, we know that this right can be found in numerous sources, um, although its uh, scope does vary between um, the source as well as its legal impact. Um, but we know it can be found in um, international legal sources such as the International Covenant on Economic and Social and Cultural Rights, as well as the Convention on the Rights of the Child, with Articles 28 and 29 specifically discussing education. And then across Australia, um, some jurisdictions uh, also have human rights legislation that also uh, ex expressly acknowledges um, the right to access education uh, with the ACT being the first to do so. Um, and then happily Queensland, um, just a couple of years ago, um, we now have a Human Rights Act um, under which section 36 um, acknowledges that every child has the right to have access to a primary and secondary education appropriate to the child's needs. But in terms of the students with disability specifically, um, which is uh, QAI's focus of our work, um, we draw upon, as I mentioned, Article 24 of the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disability. And this is sort of the primary source that we refer back to in terms of a student with disabilities right to access education, um, which states that states parties shall ensure an inclusive education at all levels, which means ensuring that persons with disabilities are not excluded from the general education system on the basis of disability, and that reasonable accommodation and effective individualized support measures are provided. We also have general comment number four, which was um, drafted by the Committee on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities uh, in 2016, I believe, which provides further guidance as to um, the meaning of Article 24. Um, whilst it's not legally binding per se, it's nonetheless considered a very authoritative interpretation of Article 24 and is seen by many as a blueprint um, for what our education policy should be aspiring towards. But the general comment itself uh, says that inclusive education, um, it requires a transformation in culture, policy and practice that involves strengthening the capacity of the education system to reach out to all learners. And importantly, it says that it's not just about students with disability, 
attending mainstream schools and being physically present. Um, that's what we call integration. It's actually about students with disability being to being able to enjoy all aspects of school life. Um, this includes um, building and establishing relationships with their peers and uh, participating in all activities of school life. So it makes that key distinction there between integration and inclusion, um, which we often draw upon in our advocacy. And finally, another key source um, for the right to education in terms of students with disability um, is the Disability Standards for Education, um, which are subordinate to uh, legislation to the Disability Discrimination Act. And they provide greater detail on um, the rights of persons with disabilities to access education on the same basis as others and detail as well the legal obligations of education providers um, under the Act. Uh, so say, for example, their obligation to consult regarding requests for reasonable adjustments uh, and indeed to make those reasonable adjustments where appropriate as well. Uh, in terms of the barriers um, that we see, um, so a lot of our work at QAI uh, is around raising awareness of the barriers that students with disability often uh, encounter when trying to realise their right to an education. I think a key barrier um, which um, has contributed to why perhaps more progress uh, has not been made regarding inclusive education is the ongoing difference of opinion as to what that actually means. Um, there's even difference of opinion within the disability community itself, uh, and particularly in relation to the ongoing role of special schools. Uh, it's the view of QAI uh, and of ACIE, um, as well as a recent um, expert witness at the Disability Royal Commission, Professor Andrew Burns, that inclusive education um, requires the dismantling of the special education system and that it does not include special schools as a long-term separate form of education. Whereas others, including the Australian government, um, argue that retaining special schools is compliant with Article 24, um, owing to the specific needs of some students with disability, which they say um, can't be accommodated and supported in mainstream schools. And in doing so, they elevate the right of parents to choose um, whether or not to to send their child to a special school or a mainstream school, uh, even though the Committee on the Rights of Persons with Disability have said that the right to education, it actually belongs to the child and not to the parent. So this is an ongoing issue of contention, um, which I think is holding back further progress with regards to education. But on a more practical level, um, we see um, that many students with disability who require support to uh, fully participate in their learning, um, their access to reasonable adjustments um, can often meet um, barriers. Uh, so it might be that um, requests for reasonable adjustments are simply um, denied or ignored. Um, perhaps the proper consultation um, doesn't happen. Um, sometimes the evidence uh, upon which they're based um, is refuted um, or it can take an extremely long time for these things to, to occur. And this can sometimes uh, and often does reflect the way in which schools and education authorities actually allocate the resources that are available to support students with a disability. Um, we know, for example, in Queensland, up until very recently, if a student with a disability um, wanted to access support under the Education Adjustment Program, um, their diagnosis had to fall within one of six categories. And if the diagnosis fell outside of those categories, um, they were unable to uh, access support under that program. Whilst this has recently changed, um, I will speak about that um, a, a little bit later on. Um, another barrier that we, we do see um, in our services is gatekeeping, the practice of gatekeeping, where um, the enrolment of a, of a student with a disability um, is denied um, by a decision by a principal or, or a school authority. Um, and we think that this as well is, is linked to the school culture. Um, while some schools uh, provide exemplary support to students with disability, others um, continue to operate practices that are discriminatory. Um, and this can um, be linked to the values uh, of inclusion, whether or not they're held, particularly by those in positions of leadership at the school, as that sort of filters down into the practices of the teachers and therefore the experiences of the students as well. But a key barrier that I wanted to focus on today um, that QAI has been focused on more recently is school disciplinary absences. And um, 
we know here in Queensland from a review of our education system from 2017 that students with disability are overrepresented in school disciplinary absence statistics. Um, I'll use the acronym SDAs if I may. Um, but we didn't have any more uh, recent data on, on this and we were finding that we were receiving a number of referrals to our education advocacy service um, for students who were being suspended and excluded from school. So um, we began to grow even more concerned about this and we submitted a right to information request to try and find out just exactly uh, how many students with a disability were being suspended and excluded. And we found that um, students with a disability received between 46 and 48% of all short-term suspensions and between 41% and 47% of all long-term suspensions between 2016 and 2020. And this is despite the fact that students with a disability comprise of only 17% of the whole Queensland school population. We also knew from publicly available data that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander students were also overrepresented in these statistics, um, with First Nations students constituting about 10% of the school population, and yet they were receiving approximately one quarter of all SDAs. So this is a very big concern to us. Um, because we know that the use of SDAs can have significant implications and impacts on students and their families. Um, there's obvious impacts to the students' um, learning abilities. They, you know, they're removed from school and denied learning opportunities. But the impacts to their mental health can be significant as well, both short term in terms of um, being fearful of returning to school, feeling humiliated, feeling anxious. Um, but long term, as well as there being connections between risks, um, uh, receiving SDAs and risks of being involved in the criminal justice system. We also know that there's significant impacts for families um, with risks to the sustainability of a parent's job. Um, if they're having to take unexpected leave to take care for their child, this can impact their financial security of the family, um, which is particularly difficult for low income and single parent families. And all of this is, is even more concerning, given the fact that we know that SDAs are not particularly effective um, at reducing behaviours of concern. Um, we know that they're based upon the idea um, that they should be a deterrent uh, and that they use as a deterrent with the view to changing the decision making of the child when they're engaging in a behaviour so that they don't do that in future. But this very um, notion misunderstands the nature of behaviours of concern, which for many students with a disability, um, it's not a conscious choice. Uh, it can be a manifestation of their disability or a reflex communication strategy in a situation where there is a lack of support for them. Um, so we're concerned that they're being overused for students with a disability and we know they're being, um, that they're not even effective anyway. So QAI partnered with the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Legal Service um, earlier this year to campaign and we wrote to the Q Queensland Human Rights Commission um, calling for a public inquiry into this because we feel there's a, a need to delve deeper into this overrepresentation um, because we need to find alternative evidence-based solutions that are going to effectively address behaviours of concern whilst keeping students um, engaged at school. For the interest of time, um, I, I won't go into the other barriers, but I'll leave them on the, on the screen. Um, some of them are self-explanatory. I wanted to just touch on the Convention on the Rights of the Child um, as another advocacy tool um, when um, wanting to realise the right to education, including for students with a disability. Um, there are many specific articles in the Convention that can be used as a tool for advocacy. But I wanted to particularly highlight Article 3, which states that states' parties must, in all actions, have the best interests of the child as the primary consideration in decision making. Um, and my thoughts are that this could be potentially uh, helpful in discussions around reasonable adjustments, um, which often come down to a balance between um, what the child needs versus what the education service is able to provide. And if we link it back to Article 3, um, with the fact that the best interests of the child need to be the primary consideration in decision making, this could be a powerful tool for advocacy. There's also General Comment 9, um, which speaks specifically about children with disabilities. Um, it's quite a lengthy comment that has uh, number, a number of aspects um, that could be used to highlight um, the rights of children with disabilities regarding education. 
Um, I wanted to draw particularly on the fact that it um, supports the call for better data collection. Um, this is something that QAI have been calling for regarding the, the use of SDAs. Um, there's a need for disaggregated data that's capturing the rate at which students with a disability are receiving school disciplinary absences. And currently this data is not available publicly, which is why we had to submit a right to information request. But general comment number nine um, supports the call for this and states that in order to fulfill their obligations, it is necessary for states parties to set up and develop mechanisms for collecting data, which are accurate, standardized and allow for disaggregation. And finally, it also um, recognizes the need for training of regular teachers to prepare them to teach children with diverse abilities. And I think that's really important because we often hear um, a, a, as a reason why a student with a disability um, shouldn't, uh, an argument for why they shouldn't be attending a mainstream school is that the teachers aren't equipped um, to support students with all abilities. And this just reiterates the need, um, for the fact that teachers need to be supported um, with the skills and knowledge in order to support all children. There's also the concluding observations of the Committee on the Rights of the Child, um, which has also highlighted the need um, for children with disabilities to have access to an inclusive education as well. But I just thought I'd finish on um, a, a discussion about what next. I mean, we need many things to happen. Um, these are just a few. Um, I mentioned a consensus around the meaning of inclusive education. Um, the inquiry into SDAs is something that QAI is continuing to call for. Um, and the other ones uh, that you can see there um, are fairly self-explanatory. But I wanted to just finish on um, commenting on a few seeds of hope that are um, starting to sprout. Um, it just goes to show that systems advocacy in this space, whilst um, not bringing about change on a very fast pace, um, in very fast paced nature, it does happen slowly. Um, and in Queensland here, at least, there are uh, some things happening that does give us cause for some hope. Um, there's potentially some changes to our discrimination laws um, following a recent review by our Queensland Human Rights Commission, um, which would impact um, the legal rights of students with disability who experience discrimination at school. Um, I mentioned that the Department of Education has recently changed the way that um, they allocate resources to students with a disability, um, although the success of this um, will ultimately, um, I guess, rest upon how many resources are made available to students. Um, but there's also been some recent resources that have been co-designed by students with disabilities and their families regarding rights under the Disability Standards for Education, um, which I think uh, is a really important um, development to occur as we know that um, one of the barriers that families experience is a lack of awareness of their rights to access um, education on the same basis as of others. And hopefully these resources will contribute to a change in that regard. And finally, um, there is an acknowledgement, certainly within Queensland at least, um, of the role of advocacy on this issue, um, with QAI um, receiving um, funding for our education program for the next couple of years. So a few seeds of hope there to um, finish on, um, but these are our contact details and I look forward to receiving some questions. Thanks, Matthew. Thank you so much, Sophie. Um, and thank you, everyone. Uh, please remember to put your questions or comments in the chat for Sophie. And uh, after the next presenter, Jonathan, uh, they will be addressed. Um, Sophie, I, I found, found that fascinating. As a former staffer at QAI, someone with a long background in advocacy on these issues, the, the presentation spoke to still the, the considerable barriers uh, that present as, as obstacles to children and families seeking an inclusive education. And your role as a systemic advocate and the role of individual advocates, and indeed the law here, the legal advocates, um, so important, I think, that um, a full-funded uh, full uh, advocacy program of individual legal and systems advocacy is still available in Queensland and elsewhere to address these issues while those considerable barriers remain. Thank you so very much. I'd like now to introduce our next speaker. Dr. Jonathan Sargent is Senior Lecturer and Researcher in Children's Rights Education, Inclusive Education and Classroom Management at the Australian Catholic University. Dr. Sargent's current research focuses on children's participation rights, 
from their perspective of their lives and their educational experience and future. Jonathan Sargent. Thank you, Jonathan. Thanks, Matthew. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'd like to begin by acknowledging the uh, traditional owners of the land on which I'm coming to you from, the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nations, and pay my respect to all of those elders, uh, past, present, and uh, emerging. Um, I'm frequently honoured to be welcomed um, in many settings as a, as a um, shared member of this land. Uh, today's uh, presentation is a cross between uh, problematizing and also provoking uh, some of the challenges around the inaction or the, the um, ability for children's rights to be upheld uh, in Australian education settings. And I suppose even the title that I've um, provided here suggests a, an enduring uh, level of provocation, although the term ignorance there is not intended to be a pejorative term. It's uh, more a reference to the lack of knowledge that many of our education community still hold in terms of the role and place of child rights, particularly child participation rights um, in our education systems, despite the Convention of the Rights of the Child being um, present and ratified since 1980, or 1990 in the Australian context. The challenge that um, we have is embedding rights awareness and practice in education in Australia, the, particularly the participation rights. One of the things, and, and Sophie referred to um, this in her um, excellent presentation uh, regarding the differing opinions that emerge through education systems. Education is inherently a contest of ideas. There are contests of philosophy, theoretical alignment, practice, and um, production. And that's a good thing. It's, it's constantly evolving and constantly being challenged, but finding a place within the education system um, brings with it a whole lot of emerging challenges for teachers, teacher education, for uh, teachers, families, parents, and school communities. Not least of which is the tiered system that we have, early childhood, primary, secondary education, then moving into higher education. Because sometimes there is some overlap in awareness and practice, but there's often a delineation. The early childhood community focus on early childhood as, as they should, but some of the learnings and some of the um, um, key um, developments in early childhood does not necessarily translate up to primary or into secondary, and the reverse is also true. The impact that that can have on children is the natural progression that children experience as they progress through each tier. But as soon as they enter the next tier, their level of autonomy and agency that they have developed and has been acknowledged as they progress to the end of early childhood, to the end of primary education, to the end of secondary education, almost gets stripped back and they have to re-earn their worthiness to, to be accepted as capable and autonomous and have agency within the system that they've just entered. There is a range of views um, on, and it's contested, not only is education a field of, of contest, but so too is childhood. And that's the area where there is much agreement and much disagreement in terms of whether children are seen as developing, developed, uh, adults in waiting, blank slates, or agentic beings in their own right. And some hold a view um, that is progressive and others hold a more traditional view of the role or the place of child and childhood education. Not all adults hold a view that children are capable. And that's not, that's not the fault of the adults per se. It may be a lack of experience, it may be a lack of knowledge, it may be a lack of awareness. Um, and some of our education systems have conspired to reduce the child's capacity or their ability to demonstrate their capacity um, through some of the practices that traditional practice of education that is maintained. When it comes to the participation rights of the child, voice is often considered an optional extra, where it's something that we do after the other rights to education 
are fulfilled. And in fact, a lot of student voice uh, programs and, um, and practices over the past 20 years have been uh, devoid of any rights awareness and rights uh, acknowledgement. So student voice in itself is a thing, but sometimes can be derided as an educational fad, something that you do that gets in the way of the core business of teaching and learning. This might be, this is also a result of a lack of participation rights consciousness or awareness. And part of that is its absence within the education, teacher education context um, and initial teacher ed education context. Child rights, participation rights are often misinterpreted and, they, and that leads to conflicts with notions of parent and teacher rights. And in some places, children's voice is considered anti-parent. And there's a, there's a contest there where it's not, doesn't um, necessarily have to be that way, but it can be interpreted that way, which again, evidences a lack of awareness of the rights of the child and what the, uh, what the convention actually says. There's mis also misinterpreted understandings of catering to the individual within group or class contexts, noting that it's the rights of the child, not children's rights. And so that sometimes the group imperatives overwrite the imperatives of the individual. One of the biggest uh, problems we have is that the UN Convention of the Rights of the Child, it's a brief document, it's only about 15 pages long, but few Australians have actually read it. And sometimes those who are involved in um, enacting some child rights uh, are not necessarily familiar with all child rights. Article 12, the rights of the child to express their opinion and have their voices heard and taken seriously is fairly well known, but there are many other rights within the convention that don't necessarily get the same airplay that Article 12 does. Within the context of education, its application is piecemeal uh, beyond the legal mandates. Upholding some rights of the child in professional practice is clearly delineated as a matter of law. And we've seen that um, most recently in response to the Royal Commission into Institutional Responses to Child Sexual Abuse and the inaction of the uh, National Principles for Child Safe Organisations. So child protection and child safeguarding is embedded, mandated and advertised and particularly with reference to the best interests of the child, Article 3. The right to an education is embedded, mandated and advertised. Although uh, that's, that can be misinterpreted as it's a choice to come to an education rather than the responsibility of uh, governments and state authorities to actually make education attractive for all those who um, seek to achieve that. And that is an issue in uh, different uh, rural and regional settings and Indigenous settings. Upholding the participation rights tend towards a matter of convenience, particularly in the Australian context. It's something extra when the main rights of education um, are taken care of. So the right to a freedom of expression and opinion can be misinterpreted because it can be interpreted as seeking to put the child's view or the child's voice above others when the general comments on child voice, uh, nowhere does it say that. And it's actually explicitly um, addressed in Article 3 of the Convention. The right to an education of quality is misunderstood. And that, again, comes to differences of opinion in the current um, uh, agenda around performative and achievement focus, the scores that we achieve, the ATAR debates, etc., often define quality as achievement rather than a collective experience. Although even in the UNCRC, the, the Declaration for the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, the Rights of Persons with Disability and the Universal Declaration of Human Rights all explicitly define what a quality education is, and it's more than just particular curriculum achievements. Child rights are relevant, but rarely explicitly linked. There are a plethora of uh, documents, policies, and um, agenda that seek to support education and inform the education 
uh, delivery. The Alice Springs and Buntworth Declaration, the um, Institute for Teach and, te um, Teaching and School Leadership, the Australian Student Wellbeing Framework, the Framework for Protecting Australian Children, Sustainable Development Goals, the Inchian Declaration, and the findings of the Royal Commission into Institutional Responses to Child Sexual Abuse are all informed by and support the Australian mandates for achieving an education of quality. But often these are referred to as the primary document, yet they're informed by the Convention on the Rights of the Child and actually support the education aims of the rights of the child. So our rights awareness is an, an enduring challenge. We have contemporary cultural priorities. There's, we have closing the gap agenda. And with the change of government, it's uh, recently more investment and identification of um, uh, supporting Indigenous uh, children has been benchmarked and has been announced. Yet the extent to which that can be achieved is yet to be determined. And whether it's just more money to some Thing, or whether there's an investment in a rights-based approach to um, closing the educational gap uh, is yet to be uh, identified. We have cultural priority of child protection, e-safety is of community concern, and recently we have co issues of co post-COVID mental health and the enduring uh, impacts of climate change. Some responses to that do actually reference and begin to embed the notion of child participation. Uh, the National Principles for Child Safe Organisations, child safety and wellbeing is embedded in organisational leadership, governance and culture. And again, that goes to one of the points that Sophie made about it's the culture of the school, the culture of the educational institute can have a big impact and uh, in terms of achieving um, a rights awareness and a rights culture. And uh, principle two, children and young people are informed about their rights, participate in decisions affecting them and are taken seriously. In the context of child safe organisations, there's a very powerful yet um, challenging, highly challenging um, principle to uphold if our community is not rights aware. The Victorian child safe standards take that a little further and they've included a culturally safe environment for uh, Aboriginal children and young people, and they're having their views respected and valued. And their standard three, which almost mirrors, but extends the child safe, uh, the national principle by talking about the empowerment of children and their rights, rather than just informed about their children and rights. And that varies across the country in the, as the different um, state-based standards elaborate on the national principles. These represent significant opportunities for rights awareness and rights consciousness in our education systems, yet it's still not being done. These principles are forward focused, aspirational and strategic. They underpin a proactive philosophy, but they're also the least visible. They're the ones we can't tick these in the child protection box because they are ongoing, they're continuous as children move through school systems and as staff and teachers change and move through school systems, these, by their design, are always incomplete if we choose to focus on them. The Convention on the Rights of the Child is relevant to education beyond Article 28, the right to an education, which is a very important um, right, but it has elaborations and references across the convention and, and Sophie again referred to other articles relevant um, to the education sphere, the best interests of the child, which is often used in contest with other rights, but that's a, a, a built in contention that actually supports a rights awareness and a rights discussion. The right to an identity, the role of parents, the right to voice, the freedom to access and impart information safety from all forms of abuse and sexual abuse specifically, the right to an education, to disability education and a quality education in Article 29, all have relevance within how we teach and how we engage with students um, in our education systems. Yet if they're not known, which is another right 
then it's very difficult for these any of these rights to be fully enacted and upheld by the rights holders being the children. Uh, Article 42, states parties undertake to make the principles and provisions of the convention widely known by appropriate and active means to adults and children alike. So without Article 42, no other right um, is possible. If the adults don't know their, the child's rights, how can we expect children to know their rights? And that's where we come to teacher education, which there is some hope with the new quality initial teacher education review, because the recommendations do in part go towards enacting a more quality, a, um, a greater focus on defining quality beyond the achievement measures. Reading literacy and numeracy, but cultural responsiveness, students with diverse needs and working with families and carers. And a quality of measure, increasing ITE student completion rates and increasing underrepresented groups in teaching degrees, including First Nations people, which is very important because you can't, uh, you can't be what you can't see. So it's, it's very important that the more we enable education to be representative of all members of the community, the more likely education is going to achieve a greater quality than beyond just those achievement standards. So who, how, why, child participation and, and children's child's rights. Um, every child, not only the chosen, sometimes in the world, in um, the sphere of a student voice, those who earn the right to be heard or those who make themselves heard are the only ones that are heard when each, every child has a right to express their opinion and be taken seriously, but also um, that part of the education focus is how to do that effectively within a respectful way. How the product process skill set and techniques for voice inclusive practice are many. There are exceptional models and there are examples from Scotland, Ireland, the UK and within Australia um, that demonstrate powerful ways to enact student voice and voice inclusive practice within the, within the education system. But again, referring back to Article 42 of the Convention, without a broader understanding and child rights awareness and consciousness, the market for these programs and this effective positive practice is going to be limited. If we don't know, we don't know what's available. Why? Part of that is convincing the unconvincibles, uh, those who don't yet believe or understand the role that children's participation rights can play in successful and positive educational experiences. Because nowhere in the convention does it say put the children in charge. It doesn't say that giving children's rights, in giving children's rights, parents, teachers and helping professionals must lose some of their rights. And in fact, uh, Articles 3 and 5 explicitly address this myth. But by restricting the opportunity for children to express their view, the extent of a child's capacity is often hidden. And if the capacity is hidden, we may not be able to recognise the capacity. That's no one's fault, but it can be hidden within the education context. So Article 29, I think that is the, an underappreciated collective obligation of the education community. We can achieve the, power, the uh, success of Article 28, the right to an education, but Article 29 goes further. And I, th I think it's representative of what we do well in education systems in Australia as a collective from the very earliest education settings in early childhood settings through primary and into secondary and to some extent into higher education if we can tick these boxes by the end of childhood, then our education, the education experience can be measured as a quality experience. It's not the job of one teacher to achieve Article 29. It's the job of all educators and all those who are a part of the child's education to be able to contribute to these key elements. And these are represented in all of those conventions that I mentioned previously, and I think is a powerful opportunity to recognise that it's more than the sum of its parts. It's actually a holistic, progressive, um, aspirational view of education 
that may be able to support the other imperatives of education in terms of prep preparing a child for their future. So how do we do it? Well, I think that hammering somebody to pay respect to a child and their voice is not going to be successful because we have that contest of ideas. And reasonably, people sometimes need proof. And so there is evidence, but there are different forms of evidence and different levels of, of power. So as a beginning point, we need to tune people in. I call it tuning in, being receptive to the possibility that a child can make a contribution to their educational journey, particularly in the fields as, um, of behaviour, of learning, of learning preference, of teacher interactions, of relationships, of bullying. There's the plethora of issues that we contend with to try and support the child. There is, there is positive contributions available to be made there. The product of child involvement needs to be presented as more than a performance. When children speak, they need to be taken seriously. Those who are unexceptional also have something exceptional to say if they're empowered to do so and if we're prepared to listen. But if we don't know that listening is, is something worth doing, why do we need to be prepared to? Including the children in the process by acknowledging rather than preaching their role. I think that um, teacher education and professional development needs to further address the misunderstandings that impede child rights action through explicit child education uh, and particular Article 24, so that a more holistic view of children through each tier and each stage of the educational journey um, can achieve better um, a rights consciousness. I think for time, I can't stop there. Thank you. Thank you, Jonathan. Uh, thank you so much for that really thoughtful presentation. I was particularly taken by the your observations around the um, national child safe um, standards and the way in which a child rights lens is sort of infused within that um, and for those who aren't aware uh, in Australia those standards now largely fall under the office uh, the national office for child safety which actually now sits within the attorney general's department that also has responsibility for Australia's human rights reporting and compliance. Um, so there's quite possibly some very interesting work that can be done with, if, with that department and, and between the human rights agencies within it and the National Office for Child Safety to bring together and to make more um, visible that human rights lens in the implementation of those child safe standards. So thank you very much. Uh, we have... Um, Questions in the chat. I've got questions from Carol, uh, Lisa and Michelle so far. Please feel free to add your questions. And of course, please feel free to use the Zoom to um, indicate by putting up your hand in the Zoom. I'm going to come to Carol uh, first. Carol, you have a, a number of questions. So I'll ask one question um, and come back to your other questions after uh, taking Lisa and Michelle's as well. So Carol asks, uh, and I might direct this one to you, Jonathan, because it may go to that question of quality education. Does a right to education mean a right to attend school or a right to learn something new every day while at school? Is it a child's right to go every day for 13 years to a building called school and quietly watch while an adult teaches other students what that child already knows and has learned many years before? Jonathan. <laughs> it's a, um, it's a, thanks Carol for the question. It's a, um, I think that it does go to quality education. If, and I think it's one of those things where if the education system is geared towards the transmission of knowledge, then that's a problem. I, I sometimes refer to the schooling experience as the only job you can't quit in your life. It represents about 10% of your life if you have a a good long one, and you're the only, the student is the only person in the school setting that does not have the power to leave, um, and but some physically leave anyway. 
and sometimes uh, intellectually, emotionally, socially, they will opt out while being physically present. So if an education uh, setting isn't considering that whole view and looking at the aims of education, Article 29, um, and beyond just the achievement standards, then uh, there is a, a challenge in that particular culture. Thank you, Jonathan. Uh, Lisa's question uh, is for Sophie, and Lisa asks, um, why, Sophie, given the Deloitte review pointed out the need to define advocacy, get a consensus, and there is a policy based on the UNCRPD, there is still such diverse interpretations. I imagine that's about the meaning of an inclusive education. Please, please let me know, Lisa, if that's not the case. In your opinion, does this speak to the reluctance to address special schools as not inclusive or something else? Thanks, Matthew, and thanks, Lisa, for your question. Um, I agree. I think it speaks to um, I think it speaks to the scale of change that uh, is required to achieve a fully inclusive education, um, as we would define um, under the ACIE roadmap, for example. And I think that um, explains why um, there has been so little um, change in terms of uh, the, the discussion around the special education setting and its going role, ongoing role um, in our education system here in Queensland. I mean, it's not just the structural changes, but it's also those community attitudes um, that are so deeply embedded around um, I guess essentially segregation um, as an answer uh, to, to people with disability, um, which we are trying to change and which needs to um, change in order for us to really achieve a truly inclusive society that we're all working towards. But I think those lasting attitudes that um, I guess resonate from the medical model of disability, um, which sort of uh, pathologizes people with a disability and um, uh, it's it, they use as a justification to I guess keep people with disability in segregated settings and those attitudes they just haven't shifted enough um, in my opinion in order for us to fully uh, engage in a proper discussion around actually the role of education it, it it's it's key to achieving the truly inclusive society that we're all working towards I mean the impact that an education can have in terms of um, changing attitudes, not just for the child with this with themselves and, and where what their place is within society, but also the attitudes of the children without disability that um, learn alongside them. Um, that's really, really key, but we just haven't seen uh, enough change there, which I think um, we, is why we haven't yet. The conversation continues to, to exist. My apologies, I was muted. Uh, thank you, Sophie. Uh, I've got a question from Michelle. Uh, I'll, I'll ask both of you. I might take um, direct it to you first, please, Sophie. Um, you mentioned the medical model. Um, Michelle asks about a health model. Would you comment, please, on a health model versus a human rights model to uphold the rights of homeless children and young people to education? Um, thank you. Um, that's um, an interesting question. Um, it's not something that I have turned my attention to in terms of preparing for today, um, but I'd be keen to perhaps hear more from Michelle what she was um, thinking about when she's talking about a health model. I'm keen to hear more about that. That might help me answer the question a bit better, if that's okay. Right. Thank you, Sophie. And, and Michelle, if you'd like to either direct message, uh, I think Claire originally, uh, or in the chat, um, we'll enlarge upon that or seek to enlarge upon that. Um, just Jonathan, if, was there anything in relation to Michelle's question that you felt you could address? It relates to a commentary on a on a health model versus a human rights model to uphold the rights of homeless children and young people to education. Uh, there, uh, um, from a well, the, the, I think that a health model. Um, refers to supporting, I, I would suggest that often a medical model is, is sometimes considered a, a deficit model. So we're looking to um, identify the gaps in the system, whereas a health model could be interpreted as seeing opportunities for supporting 
the whole development of the child and the whole development. So in the context of homelessness, how can a person be supported to meet their educational needs and their educational, have their educational rights upheld rather than um, placing the burden on the conditions which prevent the education from occurring. But um, uh, similar to Sophie, um, a greater um, understanding of the of what Michelle's referring to would, would be helpful there. Thank you, um, both of you. I, we, I hope that we can um, seek that clarification. I see there's a new message, but before we, we um, go back to that issue, um, returning to Carol's next question, which is very specific and a, and, a, and a great opportunity maybe to explore the concept of of rights uh, in relation to a very specific example. For a child with dyslexia, is it a right to learn to read using an evidence-based method instead of being told to forget about reading and listen to an audio book instead? Um, Sophie. Uh, what's your view on that question? Um, it's absolutely uh, the right of a child to learn to read. Um, I think this speaks to some of the issues that Jonathan was um, talking about earlier in his presentation about quality um, of education. And it's something that um, we continue to see as a barrier um, for many students with disability, um, that they're just not accessing um, the quality education that um, they need and or accessing the reasonable adjustments that they need on an individual basis. Um, so there needs to be uh, a greater, I guess, understanding of the individual needs of students with disability and recognition of the fact that uh, they, they do vary, but we need to be upskilling our teachers as well to ensure that they can adequately support children with diverse needs. So we need to be making sure that, um, yeah, we're not putting students in a situation where um, they're going to be um, inappropriately supported or, or don't have that support. That support needs to be there. Uh, so we need to be focusing on directing the resources towards ensuring that all students can um, can learn to read and, and, to in, and have that quality education that is their right. Yes, Article 13 actually says that the child has the, um, has the right to the freedom of that, uh, receive um, access and impart information and uh, impart information orally in writing or in print or in any other media of the child's choice. Another problem with the education system is it's often text-based and linguistically based education system that denies those with alternative methods of communication uh, the opportunity to achieve their educational provision. So I think advice to forget reading, um, well, it, it, it very tightly defines what reading actually is to begin with but also actually denies the child the opportunity to achieve their educational aims. Um, so it's bad advice, I would, say, I would say to Carol. Thank you very much. We've had a clarification from Michelle and for reasons of time, I want to move to our last question in the chat, which is from Wahid. Um, Michelle's clarification is that the national framework is proposing a health model for child safety and protection. Um, moving on to Wahid, and this will be our final question before we wrap up today, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, Wahid is the uh, Wahid Ahmad is the chairman, child protection committee of the Hall Bar Association. Uh, Wahid's question is that in Pakistan we have private schools, government schools, and madrasas, and all of them have different ways of teaching, which is why we have big gaps in our society. As per your experience, what is the best way to reduce these gaps in our social setup? Um, Jonathan, I'll come to you uh, with that one and perhaps with uh, a quality education lens. Uh, well, as we've, we've mentioned a couple of times, education is filled with contests. Um, if, if the challenges that Wahid is experiencing, experiencing um, in Pakistan is a question of resources, then that's a challenge for the wider system. If they, the government schools and the private schools are differently resourced, then there's potentially an unfair advantage. But we take out the resource imperatives if we have a look at the, again, the right to an education in Article 28 explicitly talks about uh, the reduction of illiteracy, the improvement in um, numeracy, 
and uh, cultural um, uh, connections. And Article 29 extends that to the holistic view of education. So if those systems can com come together with a shared aim, then the practices can be shared. There is significant evidence across the, um, the spread of educational delivery that regardless of resource are still effective. When it comes down to it, there's still an a teacher and a, and a class or a student um, that has the transaction that is the educa educative um, involvement. So there's significant challenges there. And if it's resources, that's a huge challenge as it is here, but not to the same extent. Um, but as a function of education, there's evidence of shared practice that would be positive. Thank you, Jonathan. You mentioned shared vision and shared practice. Sophie, universal human rights, is that, uh, is recognition uh, and advocacy for the human rights of children to an education um, part of the answer to Wahid's question, uh, a way to reduce these gaps in, in, in approach or social setup? Yes, I think absolutely. And I would just add to that, um, I agree with, with Jonathan's comments, um, and I would just add to that, it's also about ensuring the importance of the accessibility of the education, and regardless of what setting it's been delivered in, and obviously that stems to resources as well, but actually, um, you know, there are many times where um, education is provided in a way that's just completely inaccessible to a large cohort of students um, who may have diagnosed disabilities or maybe undiagnosed as well and it's just about ensuring that the educators um, become more mindful of the fact that some of their students may have undiagnosed as well as diagnosed disabilities and that their teaching methods need to be speaking um, to everyone's needs. Thanks Sophie and thank you everyone. Uh, it's time to wrap up now but I'd like very much to thank uh, Sophie and Jonathan for their thoughtful uh, incisive uh, presentations and Thank you all for your questions uh, coming to us today from Australia and, and all points of the globe. So we really appreciate your attendance. Um, please join me with me to thank uh, Sophie and Jonathan and uh, just take this opportunity to let you know that uh, our next webinar occurring within a month or so's time, so please look out for it. We'll be looking at the sustainable development goals and budgeting for, children, for children's rights. Uh, but that's it for those of us here at Youth Law Australia, Australian Lawyers for Human Rights and the Diplomacy Training Program. Uh, thank you, everyone. Uh, goodbye. We're closing the meeting now. And uh, Sophie and Jonathan, if you'd just care to remain with us uh, for a moment or two, uh, that'd be great. Thanks again, everyone. Goodbye.